scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Colossians chapter 3, if you would turn there well, verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the word of the Lord says this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these three verses, specifically in Colossians this morning. May they speak to us. May they penetrate us. May they meet us at our point of need in our soul of souls. God, you are good. (laughs) It's easy to say those words, but sometimes it's hard to believe them. Help us to learn to believe them this morning. We give this day, this time, and our lives to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, yeah, we're talking about this. This We're going to be speaking five weeks on this topic, this sermon series of what is the church. Last week, we defined the church as hands and feet. This week, obviously, what is the church? The church is love. This passage from Colossians <clears throat> starts off... Uh, Therefore, as God's chosen people, and we're going to get into that, what I'm going to do this week is I'm going to kind of go through the passage. I'm going to break it down verse by verse. We're going to talk about stuff. But it concludes with these words. Above all these things, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Think about that. If the body doesn't possess unity, if there's disharmony within the body, then the body doesn't really function too well, does it? What purpose can a body that doesn't have unity serve? If you look back in your Bible and you see it in three of the four Gospels, Mark chapter 3, verse 29, 25, Jesus Christ says these words, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln back in, what was it, June 16th, 1848, when he was nominated uh, by the Republican Party of the state of Illinois to run for the Senate seat that was open, gave this famous speech at the Republican State Convention called A House Divided Against Itself Cannot Stand, taken directly out of the scriptures and paralleling them into modern day. And if you're, like me at all, a fan of Seinfeld, you remember in season seven, the pool guy episode where we learned that a George Costanza divided against himself cannot stand. A body needs unity to coalesce. A body needs unity to function properly as it was intended to do. And that's why Paul writes about the importance of one body with many parts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's all sorts of stuff. 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, one body, many parts. So I'm going to read from you verses 14 through 20 and then 24 through 26. What Paul says about how important unity is in the body. It's kind of a tongue twister. It sounds kind of weird, but I'm pretty sure most of you have heard it before. Stick with me. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. But God has combined the members of the body and given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Unity is essential to the proper functioning of a body, of any entity, but especially the church, which if you remember last week was defined as the people, not the specific building or structure that we are sitting in. And unity is essential not only to those inside the church, unity is essential to those outside looking at the church. Think about what churches have been torn apart by over the years. 
Think about the petty disagreements, the squabbles, the, the little piece of sand that hurt, turned into this huge stone that people can't get past. So much of church um, splits in the last hundred years of our country have revolved around things with music, worship style. This instrument right here, this instrument right here, the lack of an instrument called an organ. There's no choir loft up here anymore. All these things have served to completely split apart believers in Christ, let alone the pastors themselves. The pastor doesn't wear a tie. The pastor dresses too nice. The pastor preaches too much about tithing. The pastor doesn't preach enough about tithing. Okay? The pastor does this. The pastor does that. I don't like the color of the carpet. I don't like the color of the walls. It's too hot. It's too cold. These are things that have actually torn apart churches, and it's not just something that I'm making up. Now, if you're looking at a body, a unity, a body of believers who's supposed to be in unity, and you see what's read here in the scriptures, how they're to be defined by their love, and you're saying, okay, this group of people is to be defined by love, and they're preaching Christ and Him crucified, and yet they can't get over the fact that there's a guitar on stage. There might be a slight problem with that. Unity is not only essential within the church, it's also essential for those outside the church to see unity within. Jesus said in John 13, 34, love one another. Listen to these words. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. He can't make it a whole lot more plain and a whole lot more clear than that, can he? It kind of spells it out and lays it out for us. So think about that as we start in this passage. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved... Stop right there. Stop. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. How big a difference would this verse make in our lives if we truly believed the words that were written in it and lived according to its power? What did I just say? As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, do you believe it? You, me, us, right? This is almost humorous to think about. Look around, because this is the chosen people of God. That's crazy stuff if you think about it. Then it goes on to say, not only are you the chosen people of God, you are holy, and not only are you holy, but you are dearly loved. Do you live that way every day of your life? And we all know the truth, because we don't, do we? You can all sit around and go, well, I'm sure Pastor Scott does. No, no. Or I'm sure so-and-so does. No, we don't. We don't live that way. We don't act this way and we don't always believe it, but it doesn't diminish the truth that is written in this verse, does it? It doesn't take away from the fact that our value lies not in who we perceive ourselves to be. The value in us lies in who God created us to be. And it states right here, very plain and simple in this verse, that you were created to be the chosen people of God. That's cool. You know what else is cool? A gift someone gave my son this week. Somebody was cleaning out their house and, and some of their old stuff, and they found like two boxes of old baseball cards. I mean, you're talking boxes in, you know, some of them were in books and folders. Some of them were just randomly thrown in. Some of them were in all sorts of boxes. And he said, hey, would Luke like these cards? I said, yeah, I think so. Now, that was an understatement, right? Because when I took him home, the boy's eyes just lit up. He actually asked if he could sleep with one of the books of cards in his bed with him that night. Like, it, it, to, to make an understatement, it was, a, it was a rousing success. The boy was happy. His father thinks it's cool, too. I'm looking through all the baseball cards like I was 10 years old again also. It was good times, right? Why do I bring that up? Baseball card's a pretty simple thing, isn't it? I mean, if you would just break it down and think about it, a baseball card is printed on the same material that my pizza is delivered in, right? I mean, if I was to get a pizza from, you know, anywhere, but you already know my favorite pizza king, right? I'm going to go down, I'm going to pick up this pizza, and they're not just going to hand me this pizza right out of the oven. No, they're going to put it in a box, a box that is made of cardboard. 
And this box made of cardboard is there to serve its purpose of transporting the pizza from the restaurant back to my house in one relatively decent piece without getting pizza stuff all over my car. And what's the point of the box? Not only does it keep it in, but it keeps the cheese from flowing around. It keeps the grease off the seats of my car or the floor of my car because I won't put a box of pizza on my car seat because I want grease on my car seat. But the, the pizza box is there to serve a purpose. And the box of pizza's purpose is to transport that pizza. And when we're done with the pizza, what do we do with the box? We throw it away. We burn it. We get it outside because it's not needed anymore. It doesn't serve its purpose. Now, if I was to take uh, a 1973 Mike Schmidt rookie card that's printed on this same material that my pizza box is printed on and treat that Mike Schmidt mint 1973 rookie card like I treated my pizza box, I'd be crazy and I'd be out of my mind, wouldn't I? Because that card is literally worth hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Now, I need to make you understand that I tried to think of an example with a Pittsburgh Pirates player in this instance, but I, nothing had value, so it just didn't work, so I apologize. Uh, that's terrible. I'm going to get it later, aren't I? The value of the cardboard doesn't lie in the cardboard itself, does it? The value in the cardboard lies for its purpose that its maker intended and created it for it to be. When God states that you are part of his chosen people, that you are holy, that you are dearly loved, it has nothing to do with how inherently smart or intelligent you are. It doesn't do with how magnetic your personality is, how good looking you are. You are holy and dearly loved because of the God who created you. So while you may not always feel holy, while you may not always feel dearly loved, and while you may not ever feel chosen, that is exactly who you are, and that is exactly what God created you to be. And because of that, Paul goes on then to state these words. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Think about the imagery in those words. When you get up in the morning, what do you choose to clothe yourself with? You see, since nobody in this room is naked right now, everybody has made a choice to clothe themselves with something this morning, and maybe their wife or their spouse made a choice to clothe them with it. You know, I don't think any husbands that I know of in here picked out their wife's clothing, so that's good, right? What did you do, or what did you choose to clothe yourself with this morning? Because you make the choice. Every morning when you get up, you make the choice of what you want to wear that day. Or maybe you make that choice the night before and you lay out your clothes before you, before you go to bed. So when you wake up, you're up, you're, you're ready to rock. But our clothes say something about us, don't they? Because we all choose to wear different clothes. Uh, I was just talking with Chelsea this morning and, and listening to her experience uh, down at one of her colleges. And the choice of clothing that she would have to wear if she chooses to go to this institution would be very formal compared to most college institutions. But our clothing says something about us, something about the image that we want to project. If we are a business person, then we show up to work in a suit and a tie, very professional, very clean looking. If we're an auto mechanic, it's slightly different, isn't it? I mean, you still got to wear a uniform, but the uniform serves a totally different purpose. It doesn't have anything to do with looks, but it has everything to do with functionality. Because you're going to get dirty, you're going to get greasy, you're going to get all this stuff over you. If you're a construction worker, forget the uniform. I need steel tone boots. I need a good pair of pants that isn't going to rip. I need some, some clothing that's bright and reflective because OSHA says so, right? And I need to do this stuff that makes me functional on my job. We intentionally pick out our clothing every morning when we get up. What if? What if? We put the same energy, and let's be honest, it's not much energy for most of us. What if we put that same energy every morning into being just as intentional about choosing the kind of attitudes that we are going to clothe ourselves with that day? So often we tend to view ourselves as being at the mercy of our circumstances and being at the mercy of, of, of our situations in our life. But Paul seems to be indicating that something else is going on here. He says the reason you can get up and you can choose these attitudes, you can choose these characteristics, these traits that will define you is because you are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. What does he tell you to clothe yourself with? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It sounds an awful lot like the fruits of the Spirit, doesn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and so on and so forth. 
choose to clothe yourself with these traits and these virtues. Not because of who you are, but because you are God's chosen people. But then he goes on after that and says what? Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This theme of forgiveness is constant throughout the pages of your Bible. It's constant throughout Scripture. It is always going and never ending. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Christ says these words. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So therefore, one of the marks of a church is how well they forgive. Matthew 18, 22, Peter asked Jesus this question. How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Christ's response was, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Which is basically saying infinity. You don't stop forgiving your brother. You don't stop at 77. It wasn't being literal, right? Or 490, whatever that would be. Quick math, all right, cool. You, you don't stop at that number. You keep forgiving. He goes on to tell about the parable of the wicked servant, right? The one who had this great debt forgiven by his master. And when he leaves the house, goes out and finds somebody who owes him a debt and says, look, until you pay me this, I'm throwing you in jail. And the master comes out, finds out what's going on, said, well, how can you act this way? I just forgave you such a huge debt and you won't forgive this small little infraction. So because that, I'm going to take you, I'm going to have you locked up and thrown in jail because you are basically an evil servant. It concludes in 1835, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, talking about the forgiveness of a sinner when somebody sins against you and against the church. Paul writes, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Forgiveness is written in the pages of this book. And if we believe what's written in the three verses that we're reading this morning, it is important and inherently imperative that we do it. It is the defining mark of Christ. How do I know that? Because it goes on to say at the end of verse 13, what? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So how did the Lord forgive you? And you think, well, I mean, I was in a bad place and I did all this stuff. No, how did the Lord exactly go about forgiving you? How did Christ himself make it possible for you to be forgiven? The man, Jesus Christ, was literally hanging on a cross. For you to be forgiven. But I want you to think about it because it was so much more than him just hanging on a cross. He started suffering the night he was in the garden when he was pleading with his God so intently that it said he started dr sweating drops of blood. After that, it was the kiss of somebody from his inner circle who betrayed him. Now, that in of itself would be enough to set most of us off. When somebody stabs us in the back, when somebody betrays us, when somebody who we know to be something turns out to be something different, that alone is enough to set us off. That's just the tip, the very tip of the iceberg for Christ. Because it was only moments after that where his really close inner circle of three or four friends who was there with him to lift him up and to pick him up, when the trouble came and the going got tough, tucked tail and ran the other way. And said, we're out of here. And then Peter later on, as you all know, after the rooster crows three times, realized the error of his way in denying Christ three times, who just hours ago said, Christ, I will die with you. I will never deny you. Can you imagine the betrayal that Christ went through that night? But it wasn't just the betrayal. 
It was the humiliation of knowing that he never did anything wrong, that he was completely innocent. And so this person couldn't find him guilty, so we'll send him to this person to find him guilty, and he can't find him guilty, so we'll send him back to this person to find him guilty, because the crowd demands vengeance. They want blood for something he didn't do, and I'm not willing to say he didn't because I don't want a riot to happen. So the man who did nothing is now beaten, flogged, with canes. He is whipped with pieces of glass, with pieces of metal, with hooks. So his flesh is literally hanging off his body. Within an inch of his life. I don't know how close, but he was essentially on death's door. How do I know that? Because when they flogged people back in that time, what they knew was that on average, if you flog somebody 40 times, they will survive. And if you flog them 41 times, they don't. So he was flogged 40 times. He was beaten. And then they took this crown of thorns and they stuffed it on his head. If you're going to put a crown of thorns on somebody's head, you don't just go up and place it on their head and pat it there. You don't use little sticky things to keep it on. And they weren't little thorns like on a rose bush. They're the big ones. The inch and a half, two, three inch thorns that they smash down on his head. So blood is running down his face. And they present him back to the crowd. And the crowd's like, no, we want him crucified. And so even through all this, this man did nothing wrong. We still want to crucify him. So we'll spit on him. We'll throw things at him. We'll make him carry his own cross up to the hill of skulls. And when he can't do it anymore, we'll pick Simon and Cyrene to help him carry it. And when he gets up there, we'll lay him on the cross. We will hammer him to it. Now, there's something that you don't know or always understand because we have this idealistic fantasy of what crucifixion is. But crucifixion isn't just for the physical pain. It's for the mental anguish as well. So when Christ was crucified, there's a 99% chance that he was also stripped bare naked for everyone to see. Not just a physical humiliation, but an emotional and mental humiliation as well. It says that the soldiers were casting lot for his clothes. It probably wasn't just his shirt. So he was nailed to the cross. He was hung. He went through all that. He went through all that. And when he was hanging on the cross, what were his words? Father, forgive them. The people who have hung me here, the people who are spitting on me, the people who are abusing me in every way possible, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So when I read this phrase written in this verse that I am to forgive as the Lord forgave me, it takes on a whole new significance when I put it in that perspective, doesn't it? I can't just read over that. I can't just gloss over that. I can't act as though it didn't happen. Because when Christ forgave me, yeah, he forgave me of my sins and my darkness. But look at what he went through that he didn't have to. That is radical forgiveness. And that's the kind of forgiveness that the church is called to give as well. You can never be more embarrassed, humiliated, betrayed, angry, upset, minimized, or thrown under the bus than Jesus Christ was, and he still chose to ask for our forgiveness. With that being said, let's not pretend that this forgiveness thing is easy, that it comes natural to all of us, because it doesn't. It's a battle. Forgiveness is a battle between our earthly carnal nature that wants reden- revenge, that wants redemption for something that happened to us and who we are called to be as God's chosen people. And it's a battle that will never be easy. It'll never be easy. It wasn't easy for the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. He struggled with this. Romans chapter 7. He says these words. When, e- when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. You know, the, when I, what I do is not the things I want to do. The things I want to do are not the things I do. I do what I don't want to do. He goes into this real big elaborate thing of doing and not doing. But what he's basically saying is when I want to do good, I do evil. And I just can't seem to shake it. Even though it is not easy, it is far from impossible when, when we clothe ourselves with the appropriate characteristics. When we allow God's will to have sovereign to have our number one priority in our lives, we can forgive as we have been forgiven. When we allow God to work through us. And this is good stuff. 
but it's still not the pinnacle of who we are to be as followers of Christ. Because we get to verse 14. And what does verse 14 say? Over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is the glue. Love is what holds everything together. Huey Lewis knew it in 1985. It's when he wrote The Power of Love. The power of love is a curious thing. Makes one man weep and another man sing. Change a hawk to a little white dove more than a feeling. That's the power of love. <laughs> there you go. There's your serenade for Valentine's Day today. <laughs> love in all of its facets is an extremely powerful force. Paul states it's love that binds all of these things and virtues and holds them together. Let me, put to you, let me give you another example. Did you ever think about the structure that we're sitting in today? The structure is built, uh, this facility here, I think this part was built in 72, early 70s, but I believe it was 72. And when this facility was built, it was built from the foundation up with this brick exterior. And I don't know why exactly the building committee chose to go with bricks at that time. I can guess and I can infer why because there's a number of other uh, materials you could use. But out of all of them, brick is usually the most durable exterior facade to put on a house or building. It's tough. It's going to hold up over the years. It's not going to wear away. It's relatively weatherproof. But you don't just get a pile of bricks and make a church, do you? You don't just have a pile of bricks and then all of a sudden the facility is built and you're good to go. I mean, imagine trying to build a structure with bricks and nothing else. It wouldn't last long. It wouldn't hold up. My seven-year-old son could tear it apart no matter how big the structure. My seven-year-old son could make it, render it useless and unusable in about two minutes. I don't care how big it is. It could be the size of the Colosseum. If it's made of just bricks, I guarantee Luke could make it useless in two minutes. Because a pile of bricks by itself, even though they're strong, even though they're tough. I mean, think about it. When somebody tears down a building, a brick building, especially if it has personal or historical significance, people want the bricks. They want to reuse the bricks. And there's actually companies that do that. They go to places that are being torn down and they reuse and resell bricks because of the historical perspective on them, but also because they don't make them like they used to in the coal-fired stoves and stuff, so they look different. There's an incredible demand for it. A brick provides durability, but the brick itself is kind of useless. If you don't have the joints of mortar to hold it together, it doesn't really do a whole lot. It's funny, I've never, I've never, um, we don't think about mortar joints a whole lot, do we? Unless you're a mason, you really don't. If you've never seen a mason work, you'd be very impressed by watching a mason work. You realize a lot of skill goes into that. But I've never seen anybody, I've been here almost five years now, I've never seen anybody driving along Route 64 out here, hit the brakes in front of the church, get out, check out our building, maybe even stop and take pictures at how wonderful the brick facade and the mortar joints fit together. They don't look at that and go, wow, that's amazing, because it pretty much looks like every other brick building you would see from the exterior. But in the same way that the mortar holds the brick together, love is what holds the church together. Can you imagine how many people would stop and look at this facility if there was no mortar in the walls? Because it would be a complete act of faith in God to keep it standing. It wouldn't be standing. It would be falling apart. It would be condemned. It would be non-existent. It would be crumbling. Because for the church, the physical church, to stay up, it needs the mortar. For the church, the people, to stay together, to exhibit unity, they need love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know love does not know God, for God is love. Over all these virtues, Paul writes, put on love. I'm going to close with an example of love. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's, it's a story. It's a true story. It happened in 320 A.D., so almost 2,000 years ago. 
called the Martyrs of Sebast. Forty Roman soldiers. Christians. Christ followers. Were ordered to denounce their faith and declare their allegiance to Caesar, their allegiance to Rome. The army they were fighting for. Now understand, this doesn't happen every day. This is an army that is persecuting its own soldiers. And the story goes like this. The commander tried to get them to renounce their faith by saying, the first person of you 40 who renounces their faith, I will put in a position of hierarchy, I will make him commander, I will give him whatever he wants, as long as he turns and says that Jesus Christ does not exist. None of the 40 would do it. And so he had them tortured. He started beating them much in the same way Christ was beaten, flogged and whipped. And yet still none of the 40 renounced their faith. And then it was at that time when it started going from afternoon to evening that a cold wind whipped across and he thought, I have a better idea. Stop beating the prisoners. What I want you to do is to take all their clothes off and to go make them stand on the middle of this frozen lake until they renounce their faith. And so before the guards could even strip off the clothing of the 40, the 40 took their own clothes off walked out to the middle of the lake and stood. And they stood and they stood. And the guards who were guarding them got frustrated because they were getting cold. And then the commander got another idea. He said, you know what? I know how we can end this. He said, what I want you to do is draw up hot bath water, put 40 baths around the outside to tempt them to come and get in this warm water when they are freezing cold. So they did it, and the night went on and on and on. Now, as I'm telling you the story, I must admit that I read the account um, to a former youth group of mine, and when I did it, it was weather much like we're having right now. And to really drive the point home, it was a nighttime session, so I made them stand outside in the parking lot without any coats on or hats, which I didn't tell their parents about, as I was reading this story for the five to ten minutes of the story. Because it's easy to sit in here and hear a story like that today. And I actually toyed with that idea today, although I wasn't sure how I would get all of us outside to do it together. I toyed about the idea of turning the thermostat down, so by this point in the thermos, you guys would be sitting there freezing and shaking, but then I know that somebody would just get up and turn it back up, and then it would kind of defeat the purpose. But it's easy to sit in here and hear a story like this. And the way the story ends like this, in the middle of the night, there was one soldier who crawled over to one of the tubs, to get in. He didn't have enough strength. So the guards came. They lifted him at his request to put in the tub to renounce his faith. But the shock from the warm water was so contrary to the coldness temperature of his body that it killed him instantly. Made such an impression on the soldier who lifted him into the tub. You know what that soldier did? The soldier who lifted him into the tub became a follower of Christ in that moment. Stripped down, bare naked, walked back out on the middle of the ice so that there would still be 40 Christians on that pond. All 40 Christians died from the bitter cold that night. They were burned and their ashes were spread. I tell you that story because this love thing isn't always easy. This Christian thing isn't always easy. And it doesn't always make sense to us. But the love of these Christians is what changed that life of that one soldier. Love is the defining mark of the church. It's the defining characteristic of the church. It's the mortar and the glue that holds us together. How can we not be moved by this passage? What is the church? The church is God's hands and feet, but the church is love. It's who we are. It's part of our DNA. It's who we are called to be. Let us never forget that. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your love in our lives when we didn't deserve it. Thank you for forgiving us the way that you did. And may we be challenged to forgive others in the same fashion. May we be challenged to love with the love that you have for us. God, sometimes we're at a loss for words for what you do for us. And I kind of find myself there right now. So I simply pray that we would know and experience your love in our lives. 
that we would extend that love outward and that we would be unified into a body who lives as you want us to live. Help us to love with the love that you have for us and to show the world your love through that process.